They're singing deck the halls. So now it's time for shiny balls. And for me to stop singing and torturing you all. Um, it's Make It Month 12. And this month is all about casting and it also means it's nearly Christmas. Um, and we're going to start out with the absolute, absolute basics, which are shiny little balls. Little balls, big balls. Balls on the chain. It's a really good introduction um, on how to recycle your metal, how to melt it down and form it into a different shape from what it started with. So I really hope you enjoy this month's tutorials. We're going to go across a whole range of casting options. But like I say, we're going to start out with very, very basics so that people can jump in and have a go without having to invest in extra tools and materials. I hope you enjoy it this month. And sorry if your ears hurt. So today we are making balls. Balls to that. Teeny tiny balls. So this is normally referred to as granulation and you usually see it as a decorative effect on jewellery. You can make slightly bigger balls, you can make humongous balls um, or you can just solder one or two on again the decorative effect and this is what we're going to start off with. There's um, a couple of things that affect this so when you're making balls, balls quite often if you use sterling silver um, they're slightly pitted. I'm trying to look for an example. You can see I've got this sort of cool, crinkly texture on there. Um, if you saw the videos where we ball the end of ear wires when it's sterling wire, quite often they have. I refer to them as craters, so just little sort of pits in them. Um, if you want them to be completely smooth, it's normally easier to do it with fine silver. Or apparently argentium is really good for this as well. Um, the other thing is as well, if you do them on a flat surface, they will have a flat bottom and a lot of people are like oh well you know I prefer to have them round all the way around um, but one thing to consider is um, if they have a flat base on them then normally it's easier to get them to stay put and solder them in place exactly where you want them to go but we will also cover how to make them completely round as well for those of you who want to make a perfect sphere so making the little balls that's the introductory way of casting or just melting your metal down to be um, Strictly correct, casting is more when you have metal in something and you pour it into a recess of some kind. So that's the other things that we're going to look at will be involving those techniques rather than just melting things flat on the surface. Um, an example of really easy and fun casting um, is water casting. And here is a little ring that was water cast. So it's got three little sort of cup shapes on there, hollow forms from the last week. Um, three little shapes, organic forms, it's very much an experimental technique, so when we look at that I'll talk you through the different things you can experiment with, um, but it normally produces these little sort of cup shapes in various forms to play with, and it's a brilliant way of using up any scrap silver as well, and again you don't need much to get going with it. So the water casting is where you melt your metal and you pour it into water, hence the name. But there's, you can use a very similar technique with a whole host of other things. So one that's quite popular is um, in the US is broom casting. Um, for whatever reason, in the UK we don't have as many brooms like that. So you're almost like a witch's broom, so the long um, bristles on it. And what they do is they dampen it so it doesn't catch on fire and then you pour your molten metal into those bristles that have been sort of bound and contained and you pour it in and you get these sort of elongated forms that are really pretty but what we tend to do more in the UK is um, spaghetti casting. <laughs> so very very similar, similar idea so you've got these long forms that you're pouring the hot metal into and then when the metal hits it, it cools and you end up with these little shapes um, but it's just, it just tends to be a little bit more accessible and cheaper um, so I'm going to show you how to do that. Spaghetti casting, any sort of medium that's similar to that, like um, lentils, beans, other shapes of pasta, rock salt, they can all give really nice effects. So again, we're going to have a little bit of a play and experimentation of pouring molten metal into different things. I'm going to show you a cheats way of casting into shapes. Um, so similar to um, cuttlefish casting and sand casting, um, but 
quicker and easier and you need, again you need less stuff to be able to do it so I'll show you that way and then hopefully we will also work up to um, sand casting but I put my hands up now it is not my strong point which is one of the reasons I wanted to pick casting for the final month just to push me into spending the time to get sand casting working regularly and in a more controlled manner um, rather than ending up with sort of legless horses like we did the other day. It's an example of when sand casting goes right. When I did my 100 day project, because um, the 100 days of recycling the same bit of silver over and over and over again, 100 consecutive days, um, by the time I got to the halfway point, the silver was coming harder and harder to work with. And by the time I came to day 100, the only thing I could do with that metal was cast it because it just wasn't workable any other way anymore because I'd abused it so much. Um, and the finished product I made was a little acorn which had been sand casted. Um, so I say it is possible. And then the other thing we're going to discuss, but I don't do in-house, but I'll show you the prep methods for it, is um, lost wax casting. So this is a winky on my pinky, <laughs> thanks to Rue, um, Rue Jewelry. So I'll tag her in this because everybody needs a winky on the pinky, but also from uni, here's a little soldier that I made. So back to the balls. I'm going to show you how to make basic ones and then in theory anything that you want to add them to as decoration is up to you, whether it's something super simple, whether it's a small thing, a big thing. Um, but just to let you know, the other thing they're good for is when we are doing things like flush setting. So flush setting is where the a faceted stone, so a diamond shaped stone, is set flush completely down into your jewellery design. Now even tiny stones are often quite deep and therefore you end up needing a piece of jewellery, a piece of metal that's quite thick to work with and quite often when students want to do flush setting and they're bringing their own materials, even when they've planned it, the metal just isn't thick enough. So a cheat's way around that is to make a little ball of silver but then flatten it and solder that onto your jewellery so you can have a thin piece of jewellery but you've added extra thickness by adding a ball and then you can drill and flush set into that which works quite nicely. So here I've got my borax, my flux, and I've mixed my flux up and I've got some scrap silver sat in there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take out any scrap silver that I want to melt and put it onto my fire brick. I'm just using a normal fire brick at the moment. I'll talk about different options in a little bit. Then I've got my torch on and what I need to do is point my flame at the piece that I want to melt and unlike when you're annealing and soldering things, you really do just want to hold the flame on the piece because we're actively trying to melt it this time. Whereas normally when we're still the thing, we're actively trying not to melt things. That's it starting to go. Normally when I do this, I put another brick here so that the heat will bounce off it because it's quite cold in here. It's taking a bit longer, but as you can see, it's starting to go into a little ball. One. I've got fire brick here as well, just so the heat will bounce off. You can see the difference in how quickly it heats up. This is more silver than the last one, so I'm going to end up with a bigger ball. Starting to shimmer. As you can see it a bit more. just need that to cool. Now because um, they got so hot when melting the chances are they're stuck to the brick like so but normally if you leave them to cool naturally they will release on their own. Um, if they don't you can always dunk them or pour a little bit of cold water on them and they will release. If you force them it's going to take half the brick with it and then you have to sit and chip all the brick off. Right, that's them off. It still has a little bit of brick on it which isn't unusual so what I'm going to do in the cold water to quench it and I can show you properly. Normally, if you just give it a little rub with your fingers once you've cooled it, um, any brick residue, fire brick residue, will just rub off. Um, if for some reason it didn't, 
then you can um, just take a little bit of file or sandpaper to it. So I've cooled this one as well. I'll check the back, give it a little rub, scratch it with my fingers, and then I'll pop it in the pickle to clean. And then I'll fish them out when they're clean in a minute and show you how they look. If you want your balls to be perfectly round, one of the things you can do is make a round recess in a charcoal block. Um, the reason that they come out with a flat back is if they're sat on a flat surface when the metal melts it will just take on that flat surface whereas if they're sat in a little recess the metal will take on the shape of the recess. Um, charcoal, when you carve it, whether it's with a rotary tool or by hand, is messy. So you don't really want to be breathing in this charcoal dust so you will want to wear a um, dust mask or something similar just to make sure you're not breathing all this in and contain it in something just to make it easier to clean up even if you just lay down some newspaper something that you can pick up easily um, but I'm just going to make another couple of recesses and I'll show you how you can then melt it onto here I've swapped to my smaller torch just so it's easier to use um, sorry, so that it's easier to see close up so I've got two bits of scrap silver and they sat in the little recess that I made and then I also have a soldering poker um, so that when they melt, if they don't quite go in the little hole, I can give them a little poke. And again, I'm just pointing at the metal because I want it to melt and to go into a perfect little ball. And the same again on this one. And because they're sat in that little round recess, they should make a perfectly round sphere. Just like that. The um, other good thing about the charcoal block, so not only can you carve into it, charcoal absorbs oxygen and it's the oxygen mixing with the gas and the copper content in sterling that creates those little pits we were talking about. So if you do these on a, copper, um, on a charcoal surface, they tend to come out a lot smoother because the oxygen, um, it absorbs oxygen. So just pick it out in the water on a cool surface, same on this one, I'm gonna pick it out of the charcoal into the water to cool it and there I have a perfectly round little ball or two in fact so super easy and I'll talk to you more about charcoal blocks um, in a little minute but again for just now these are going to go into the pickle to clean right one of the things about charcoal blocks is this is a compressed charcoal block um, they don't last very long so you're looking at between 10, 20 pounds for one, um, and they are great to have, but like I say, they, they, when you heat them, the surface starts to sort of melt away, almost degrade. And then obviously if you start carving into them and things like that, then they degrade even quicker. But there's a couple of things you can do to help. So one of the big things that I would recommend is wrapping your charcoal block in Binding wire. So can you see I've got wraps and wraps and wraps and wraps of wire around this. Binding wire is just a very inexpensive um, thin steel wire which you can bind the block together with because when charcoal um, heats and contracts it does tend to um, move and contract like I just said. So you end up with crack lines, faults in the charcoal. In fact that crack goes all the way down the side here but because I've bound it it's still staying together whereas if I hadn't had that wire around that side that would have been in two parts by now even though it's a fairly new block so it's definitely worth getting some binding wire and just preparing it the other thing is some people worry about them catching on fire and then they quench them with water afterwards I've never experienced this but obviously keep an eye on it but I always think um, if you, you can get away without quenching it the better because the more sort of external forces you put on this the, the less time they're probably going to last but they're definitely good to have a little play with. another thing you can do instead of just um carving out little ball recesses you can carve shapes into it so i'm going to do that now so again dust mask on because it's going to be a bit messy Normally, the um, 
the inside of the charcoal, the bottom of where you're carving, it will be the front of your piece. So if you're doing something that has a right way and a wrong way round, you need to draw or write it back to front. making it look okay. So I carved out my K shape, I've laid my scrap metal in the recess and I have my soldering poker ready to poke anything that sort of doesn't go into the mould. When metal melts, like you saw when we made the balls, it wants to go into a dome shape. So this isn't going to just naturally fill the K shape on its own is going to need a little help, but I shall show you how to do that in a second. In a minute, I just need to keep heating it until it melts. Just to go. I also have my tweezers so I can add more silver as it melts. Okay, now it's melted, but as you can see, it's just sitting on the surface. So what I need to do now is impart some force onto it. So what I have is a steel block. And what I need to do is I need to remove the heat from the blowtorch and then come in with the steel block and apply some pressure. There we go, so this is going to go in the cold water, pinch it, and then what I can do is take a brass brush, give it a scrub, just get the last of the um, charcoal off it. And you can see the start of the K there. So this needs to go in the pickle to clean up and then again I'll show you how everything comes out in a little second. While that's cleaning I just want to have a little chat about safety. So we've already said if you're carving out anything dusty you should wear a dust mask. Um, the other thing is just making sure you work in a safe confined space. So as you can see my space is quite big um, and therefore if the metal was to roll off of the brick it would fall onto another heat proof surface. The other thing you can do if in doubt is you can use bricks to build a wall around the surface that you're working on. So again, if it was to roll, it's going to come into contact with something rather than rolling off and landing on your toes, which you do not want. One of the reasons why you should always, always, always wear proper footwear in the studio. And also, if you're working at home, just be very wary if you're working on carpet, because if you heat anything and drop something hot, onto the carpet there is a chance that you know at the very least it's going to damage it and then there's a chance of fire so you need to be um, conscious and prepared. One of the things you can do is work again in a confined space. If you're short on space you could use a pan, you could use your um, soldering bricks in there so you've got a heat proof surface but if any molten metal was to fall it's going to stay contained in this pan. Um, the other thing that you really need to think about is if there was a fire, if something did catch, what are you going to do about it? So I'll run you through my options in a later video. The other thing, when you saw me imparting the force, it's really important when you're learning. You need to act quickly because otherwise the metal will cool down too much. But if you actually pull this in front of where the flame is still on the piece, you are going to burn your fingers. Um, so you can get things like cool hand gloves and stuff like that because um, you don't want to burn your fingers. But personally, I would rather be able to feel if something's getting a little bit hot, um, so therefore I don't get too close to it, whereas I worry that if I wear a big glove, I wouldn't necessarily notice if I was doing something that I shouldn't be. So, like I say, it's a swift movement. You have to remove the flame, then you come in with the force rather than bringing the force in while the flame is still on the piece. The other thing you need to take into consideration is because it's molten, because it's a liquid, don't throw it down because if you throw it down then again it could splatter so again that comes back to making sure you've got a safe space and a wearing sort of heavy protective clothing but in an ideal world just nice smooth movement and then it won't splat so here we've got the two original balls so they're nice and domed on the top and then they have flat backs which is handy for soldering 
And then next up we had the two very round balls where I made a little recess in a charcoal block so that they could be round all the way rather than just on one side. And then lastly, I've got my little K where I push the metal down into a carving I did in the charcoal block. So I'm going to clean this up now and show you um, the finished piece. All cut out and then I'm just going to give it a little file on the edges just to refine it. One little K. Some little balls. So, anyway, have a go. If you've not melted silver down before, just make some little balls. It's so easy. You can either get um, like 0.8 mil or 1 mil wires, really good, because if you want them all to be exactly the same size, what you can do is either measure them, the starting metal, exactly the same, so it's wire, say every bit you cut is 3 mil, and then you'll have uniform balls, or you weigh your metal if it's scrap. So if you were using scrap metal like I was and you want to have uniform balls, you just need to get yourself a set of micro scales, so scales that can um, measure very, very, very light amounts. And then what you do is you just get your scrap, put it on the scale. Um, so say you're looking for a gram. And then when you reach a gram, that's one little pile of metal that you're going to melt into a ball. And then you get some more scrap and make another little pile, weigh it until you get a gram again. So whether, like say, you're doing this from fresh material like wire or whether you're reusing your scrap, there are ways to sort of control it and make sure that you get the same uniform size every time. And like I say, if you want to have something perfectly round, then you, there's ways of making recesses. Or if you want to do a specific shape, again, there's ways of making recesses. But you just need to be careful when you impart the pressure that you don't slap it and end up... Um, spraying metal everywhere. We've never ever had that happen, but there is a risk. You can also um, use stones like cubic zirconias and melt the metal into them, which is quite fun. It has to be stones that can survive the heat. So diamonds, wood, but cubic zirconias are a lot cheaper. I melted it, into, melted it, melted it into a bowl. Hmm. A ball. And then when it's hot, I'm just imparting some force down into the recess. And there's the little stone. Little stone in a molten blob of silver. There's another little stone. So it just shows you, I mean these as well, it's, it's like a cheats way of doing um, flush setting. That we talked about before where you physically have to carve out a recess for that stone to sit into. Um, this way you don't have anywhere near as much control obviously but it was really really quick um, and fun to do. I say you just need to make sure they're stones like most cubic zirconias or at least good quality ones that can withstand the heat. You can always do a little bit of research about which stones can and which stones can't. Um, but for most people, cubic zirconias are the way to go, um, coloured ones or plain ones when you're starting out. And then you can work your way up to things like diamonds and sapphires if you um, want to in the future. But um, I hope you have a play. I hope you have a safe play. Like Remember, make sure you make a safe area just in case the molten metal moves. Um, but yeah, have a go. When we get on to the more, the larger scale casting with crucibles and big beastie blowtorch and things like that I'm going to go into a bit of fire safety and you know getting things in place before we do those um, so let's say I'm going to go into it in more detail soon what we're sort of doing here is you know small amounts it's flat on a brick rather than pouring it so it's not as big a fire safety risk but it is still worth considering um, so like I say just making sure that you're wearing something heavy and decent just in case a bit of molten metal comes towards you make sure you're working in a safe area in case something rolls it's not going to roll on the floor it's not going to roll onto you or onto your foot it's especially important if you sit while soldering personally i always think people should stand while soldering just in case anything hot drops in your lap anyway um and at the very least always have some water by your bench if not a fire blanket and a, um, a fire extinguisher 
here's the finished pieces. So we've got the pieces with stones included in them. We've got the pieces we started with, little balls. There's the very round ones. Here's the ones with the flat backs. Here is, um, just as an example, a ring with a flush set stone, just to show you the difference between doing the what's considered the proper technique um, compared to melting metal around a stone. They look quite similar, especially if I gave um, that silver a file and polish afterwards. Here's a big blob from melting a bigger bit of metal. So remember, you can weigh out your metal if you're looking for um, specific sizes. There's a little blob that's been soldered onto a ring, and there's the K that I carved out of the charcoal block. So, like I say, if nothing else, with what you've already got, you should be able to start making some little balls and potentially have a bit of a play as well by carving out shapes or including stones.